Blake Richardson from Block Tower Capital, a multi-strategy hedge fund. It's great to have you here to talk about DeFi. Welcome to Real Vision, Blake. Thank you, Ash. Great to be here. Well, it's really a pleasure. Blake, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about what DeFi is. It's a term that gets thrown around a lot. Many people probably don't know the exact textbook definition. What's your definition of DeFi? Sure. So uh, decentralized finance is any application uh, built on blockchains that have um, some sort of functionality that uh, mimics existing financial services. Um, so we would categorize that as um, decentralized exchange or trading, uh, lending um, assets such as uh, synthetics or even uh, dollar, uh, dollar assets, um, and then insurance contracts as well. So pretty much anything that's in the traditional financial world that you can do there that's replicated on blockchains, that would be the category that would be decentralized finance to us. Like, let's break down that taxonomy. What's the one sentence definition of each one of those items? Sure. So um, DEXs, for example, decentralized exchanges, um, the first one, they are um, basically contracts built on um, either the Ethereum blockchain or any number of um, layer one blockchains where uh, users can trade and um, exchange assets um, in a peer-to-peer -peer manner without a centralized in intermediary. So for example, um, in a traditional model, you might have to go through um, you know, prime brokers or uh, you know, a bank or, or other uh, mechanisms to trade, um, say, stocks, you know, wh whatever you would, would trade in the traditional world. In crypto, uh, decentralized exchange would allow you to trade uh, crypto assets, so anything built on that blockchain. Um, or any number of other contracts that are created. Um, lending would be um, you know, exactly what you would expect. It's um, basically pools of capital that are available to be borrowed out. Um, people, you know, if investors, users supply this capital into smart contracts. Those smart contracts then um, have mechanisms in place that allow them to um, you know, basically stay solvent while people bo um, borrow from them. They're often over collateralized. And then users, you know, from anywhere in the world, 24/7, um, near instantly, can go in and access that liquidity as long as they um, match the parameters within that, um, within those individual protocols. Um, stable coins are just dollar coins built on on, on you know smart contracts. So um, the most famous of which are uh, Tether and uh, USDC. Um, so so they're just there's two different kind of primary mechanisms of a uh, stable coin. One is where there's a dollar. Um, one for one sitting in a bank account somewhere. Um, so that's kind of a hybrid of traditional finance and decentralized finance, where then there's an asset that represents that. Um, the other would be algorithmic stable coins, where it's actually not backed by dollars. Um, you can go into that a little bit deeper um, later. And then derivatives um, in synthetics are kind of a, a combo, but it's any sort of options contracts or um, synthetic assets, such as synthetic stocks built on, on a blockchain. And insurance is um, kind of a similar category where you're insuring against um, smart contract hacks or um, custody failures, but using smart contracts on that native blockchain, the most famous of which would be uh, Nexus Mutual, um, and that provides insurance against other activities within DeFi. So let's start with uh, DEXs because they're probably the most widely known at this point. Um, Sushi Swap, Pancake Swap, Uniswap, all names that uh, are reported on quite frequently. Give us a little bit of a sense for people who may be relatively new to the space, what the significance of those exchanges are, what they're used for, who's using them, and what the use case is. Sure. So it's really the, the first time um, ever that you could trade an asset with uh, a counterparty that you just you, you don't know and don't um, have any prior relationship with there's um kind of for better or worse there's um not kyc um for some of these exchanges which means that you know over time we'll see that kind of probably uh, emerge into the industry but at least for now um anyone from anywhere in the world can be your counterparty by um swapping with these contracts in a, in a manner that allows you to trust the other individual. Um, so when you the, kind of that's the that's the significance. The users are all sorts of uh, users. It's uh, hedge funds such as ourselves. Um, it's you know individual retail investors. Um, you know VC investors. It's it's anybody that wants access to liquidity on crypto assets where people have provided into um, any of these different uh, exchange mechanisms. 
Typically, they work by providing liquidity in um, what's called an automated market maker. Those AMMs um, have different functionality, but typically they're two-sided 50-50 markets where people supply capital and then people can trade against that capital. So effectively, those assets are sitting in the protocol and that's what allows anybody to go in and access that. So you trade into one and get out the other. There's a curve that determines the you know, the price change um, as a function of liquidity. And then you're done. There's not really any um, extra steps beyond that. Why it became significant was crypto in 2017 and earlier wasn't um, was really reliant on centralized exchanges, which kind of is against the ethos of the space originally. It was like we have these decentralized assets, but we really can't access them them in a way that um, you know removes that middleman. So like large you know large companies such as you know Binance, Coinbase, others are centralized in, in that sense. And so this provided an alternative that allows the same functionality without having to worry about like a exchange failure or solvency issues of, um, you know, of like a specific business's operations. Um, another kind of key piece that a, a lot of people have talked about um, that was a bigger issue in the past was like insurance, like FDIC insurance against deposits. There's a lot of risks in DeFi, but the one thing you can be uh, sure of is that um, if you have an asset in that contract and you have the private keys to that, it, it is your asset. And you'll, if that protocol has assets in it, then you know that that protocol is solvent. Now, there's a lot of risks that uh, I'm kind of oversimplifying there, but that that is very significant. It's like you can see the real-time status of that exchange and know what assets are in it and if it's functioning without any sort of... Uh, uh, excess or additional uh, layers of audits or other other um, kind of financial reporting because it's all available on the blockchain. Yeah, talk a little bit about those risks that you've mentioned. Obviously, these are incredibly new frameworks for thinking about trading assets. What are the risks and how do you categorize them? Sure. Um, the biggest risk is uh, smart contract risk. That's uh, There's lots of different ones, but it really boils down to um, are the contracts um, designed correctly? And there's a lot of things that come out of that. So one would be like uh, economic uh, incentive risk, where there's say um, like a token that represents your uh, share in that underlying collateral. Um, that underlying collateral, um, that token has a price. Occasionally, um, there's risk of say that price deviating based on the oracle that reports that price. Um, going away from the the correct value, so that would be Oracle risk, but it's it, it kind of a subset of, of smart contract risk. Um, realistically, it's these contracts are new, even though we've tested them for you know m many years now uh, in the space. They're still you know they're very complex, and there's often um, you know just quirks or bugs in the contracts that will result in. Um, Never all the funds, or at least not not uh, to date, but some subset of the funds potentially being at risk um, or exposed to somebody um, coming in, exploiting that vulnerability and uh, taking those funds. We actually recently did an analysis uh, alongside the insurance, um, you know, kind of the insurance theme that we were discussing of total, uh, like total hacks as a percentage of value locked and exchanged in DeFi. And it's actually a very, very small fraction. So I don't want to overstate the risk. Um, I actually think I have the number um, here. It's something like a, a half percent or let's see, something like a half percent of all um, assets that have ever been locked in DeFi have been stolen, which is which is high in a certain sense. But it's also compared to how new the industry is, it's, it's pretty impressive. And so it's, it, it isn't like an existential risk, but there is that uh, kind of like we have to review every new contract we look at. Things like Uniswap, Sushi Swap, Pancake Swap that you mentioned have a lot more value locked in them, and they're tested, you know, kind of more frequently. Um, the Lindy effect of them being around longer also uh, makes it less likely that the hack is discovered kind of uh, each day thereafter. But there is still risk to those contracts as well. Yeah, you mentioned the curve. This is the bonding curve, and this concept I think is so crucial for people understanding uh, a lot about how liquidity pools work. It's the relationship between price, supply, and demand. Talk a little bit about this. Explain it at the fifty thousand foot level. How are these relationships established, and why are they so critical in pricing Dex assets? Sure. Um, so. Uniswap pioneered the concept of a um, constant bonding curve AMM, where 
effectively um, all assets are priced when you supply liquidity on a uh, constant product curve where for every unit up you move, there's a certain um, kind of formula that moves it up uh, in, in either direction. So effectively, the less liquidity there is, the, the larger a trade will move that asset. Um, so prices in that sense are static and that they don't move unless somebody trades into that pool and moves that price. And so we'll see divergences between um, a sushi swap pool and a Uniswap pool because they each have their own curves. Although those curves are, you, you use the, the same constant product, they um, will have you know, just different liquidity pools with different trades. And so people are between those. It's not like an order book model where people are putting bids and right. asks out. It's effectively always, there, there always is a bid and ask. And in exchange for that liquidity you're providing into the protocol, those LPs get trading fees paid back to them or additional inflation from the governance token of those protocols. So like SushiSwap pays out people that provide that liquidity um, in Sushi tokens, so they continue to do so. And it actually makes the exchange more liquid. It, it, they, they do that to create a positive network effect of more liquidity and more trading. You know, uh, the, the value then of the token w w would go up. Well, you know, let's maybe step it up even one more level. Let's talk about sure. automated market makers. Let's talk about LPs, which are the liquidity pools, uh, and understand a little bit about the framework for how this is different, uh, as you point out, from an order book model where you have bids and asks. The liquidity is being supplied, uh, and it's actually being locked in those contracts as opposed to just having bids and asks. Talk a little bit about what that means and why it's significant to investors. So it... It's actually like, like as an investor, we have the option if we have idle capital where we're long both of those assets, we could provide liquidity and basically act. Anybody in the world can act as a market maker in, in that sense, which is very different than order book right. models where um, typically market making is active, right? It's like there, there's people that are professionals that go in um, and create those markets and make sure they're liquid. And there's, you know, that's their, their full time job. This is effectively passive liquidity, and that passive liquidity is available to anybody. Um, so, so like ultra high level, it's a it's kind of the exact opposite of approach where instead of active, you know, market makers, professionals going in and creating those markets, this is any investor in the world that has idle capital where they believe in those two, you know, those two assets. They're they're already long them. Um, there's, there's other mechanisms as well. Um, they then can provide that capital, earn trading fees. And be that market maker for the for those markets. But primarily, the the way that this is done is you have to obviously, when you say control the capital, you have to actually own the coins. You have to control Correct. the private keys. You have to deposit them in the smart contracts, and then you get paid in the governance tokens for those contracts for mm -hmm. providing that liquidity. And then you basically provide it at a at a fixed price point, which in some ways is kind of the analog, I guess, for the bid or the offer. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. What well, what well said. Um, I. Um, I would add that um, we've seen different curves emerge. So to, to, totally accurate in, the, in that description. There's also different um, kind of pricing mechanisms along those curves. So what the most famous of which that is different is called curve, which I know is kind of uh, confusing. And they have a, um, it, it's easier to kind of just draw it, but they, instead of a, like a, a direct relationship, they have a portion in the middle, which is, uh, is, is flatter and more linear on that curve. Um, that allows for much, much lower slippage between trades. That's I ideal for assets that are um, the same, ideally the same asset, just different uh, representations. Like dollar, um, dollar stable coins, like say Tether and USDC, effectively they should be one to one. And so that curve makes it where those trades have very minimal slippage and incentivizes liquidity as well, as you said, where people are you know, paid out in the governance token to do that. Right. You know, it's interesting. We'll get back to the taxonomy, but I want to ask you a bigger mm. picture question. Obviously, Blake, you're yeah. a young guy. You've been in this space uh, effectively your whole career. Um, what's it like when you have this conversation with institutional investors in their 40s and their 50s who are trying to get their heads around the way this space works, which is so very different from the macro world, the capital markets world? It must be a major kind of conceptual leap to make. I, I think people are getting more used to it. It definitely is a, a major leap. Um, it just takes time and education. Like the learning curve is high because you have to first understand kind of the primitives of how blockchain works before you can conceptualize why you would put your hard-earned money into these random pools that do have a lot of risk. 
Um, so it kind of comes from a basis of trust in the concept of crypto and blockchains before you can take that next step and that next leap right. into DeFi. So like, if you're comfortable with Bitcoin or you're comfortable with Ethereum and you understand how that works, then you're like, okay, I understand that these things can function at scale with a lot of capital, but what, like, how is lending or you know exchange relevant to that use case? And so I've found it very rare that you know you find someone that wouldn't trust one of those and they would trust DeFi, but they might actually right. understand the the use case better where they're like, lending makes sense. They're productive assets. That's usually a way that I think that a lot of a lot of institutional investors start to understand DeFi is because it it starts to introduce metrics and ways to measure the uh, value of these assets in a way that other cryptos didn't have. So right. in, back in 2016, 2017, the common criticism was, well, well, what are these? They're just speculative. You can tell me it's digital gold all you want, but digital gold, it, like that's that's it's almost medic in the sense that it's a, it, the competition to be digital gold isn't. Um, you can't really measure it other than just saying that it's it's growing, it's being used. By it, it's, we claim it's a store of value. You can look at some some metrics, but it's much harder to assess that and say this is the the price to earnings ratio. This is the market cap to TVL of these assets. This generated right. you know two billion in revenue. Um, that's that's much easier to conceptualize, even if it's not um, even if you're still kind of kind of grappling with understanding. The core, like, why is this safe? Why am I trusting this with my, you know, trusting my money with these, these systems? So yeah. um, that's kind of like the, the common path I see of uh, people starting to, to get their hands around this. Yeah, we should say TBL is total value locked. Um, yes, it is yeah. interesting because, you know, you think about it, you really need to understand the blockchain primitives on the one hand, and you also need a pretty sophisticated understanding uh, of the way that the financial and investment world works before you understand some of these use cases. Let's talk a little bit about those use cases. When we're talking about borrowing and lending uh, indexes, give us a sense of what the proposition is from both sides of that trade, in other words, for the borrower or the lender. Sure. So the largest current uh, lending platforms are Compound, Aave, and Maker. Each of them, uh, MakerDAO, each of them have kind of different functionalities, but kind of at its core, the concept is um, capital owners. So somebody that has ETH or um, you know, other assets on hand, dollar stable coins that want to basically have some sort of productive earnings on those assets, provide them into uh, capital pools. That then allows uh, borrowers to come in and access that capital. And there's a relation, an interest rate curve that um, is the trade, you know, that allows uh, that market to uh, function efficiently. So there's a, a curve for each market within a compound, for example. and Within that, you would say a borrower would come in in an over collateralized model, which all three of these are, you would have to post collateral of your own, something that you're comfortable that you're already holding. You can then borrow other assets against that uh, that collateral and then you know do whatever you want with it, come back and you're if you say don't repay that loan, then the existing collateral could be uh, liquidated or, or, or taken. You basically can't withdraw that existing collateral right. until your, your loan is repaid. So really high level, it's like a, a simple uh, market for allowing people on the lending side to earn, you know, earn revenue on their, their assets that might not be productive. Otherwise, on the borrower side, they're taking it out. Typically in, in, in crypto, it's um, for, for speculation, but we are seeing um, kind of new use cases of businesses accessing um, these lending pools for capital to run their businesses. Uh, Compound, for example, has a recent um, kind of push on the institutional side. They launched their treasury product, which is offering uh, kind of stable yields on um, USDC deposits uh, for you know, people that want to access that, uh, that liquidity. Right. Yeah, I should probably say I made the jump from DEXs to lending for a, a good reason, because they're very similar conceptually in the sense that you're locking value in smart contracts uh, and then interacting with that value uh, in some way. Uh, obviously, the DEX is the use case uh, is exchange in lending its yield of productive asset and speculation mm. on the opposite side. Over collateralization, we should probably point out, is important uh, because the values, the relative pricing uh, can move. And if it moves quickly, obviously, there's the potential of a loss. If it's over collateralized, if there's price movement, there's some insurance, a buffer of capital against that loss. Yeah, th there are um, a very new frontier in DeFi is addressing that exact issue, which is right now we have to over collateralize because 
crypto is decentralized in the sense that if somebody doesn't repay that capital, but what do you do? Like there, there's no way to, you know, find somebody that's across the globe and enforce a contract if you don't have that contract. So these existing protocols have all addressed that with over collateralization. And if that collateral value drops below the borrow value, you can get liquidated uh, where you keep what you, what you have, but the, the, the protocol takes back uh, that capital that you posted. So that, that's how they uh, address it you know, to date. There are new models. Um, uh, TrueFi, for example, is a under collateralized lending platform where they do have those contracts in place, where they have a master loan agreement with their borrowers. Their borrowers are um, trusted um, kind of players in the space. You, you can go on. There's, there's currently, I think, 13 borrowers. All of them are um, either hedge funds or exchanges or other other different um, institutions within the, the, the crypto industry. They then borrow at fixed uh, interest rates against capital that's provided. And TrueFi will be introducing credit scores, on-chain credit scores, assessing their activity and providing that back to the users. It's still very early stage. The comparison right. would be like 20 billion in kind of these over-collateralized models. This is much more like 200 million um, dollars locked in this um, that's being right. lent out. So, you know, very early stage there, but that is like a new frontier in DeFi where people are trying to address that, that issue. Yeah, and very different, obviously, when you're talking about, on the one hand, over collateralization, which is the security, and the other, uh, basically doing basic credit research uh, to determine who risk uh, risky borrowers are and who trustworthy borrowers are, a very different framework. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more uh, about the borrowing and lending component. I think we covered a little bit of this, but obviously it's pretty easy for people to understand. Uh, I think on the uh, lending side, you have a productive asset. You don't want to sell it. You want to get some yield on it. The goal is you want to lock it up in one of these smart contracts and earn uh, and earn return on it. On the borrowing side, effectively, it's primarily at this point, at least, you say that there are some operations uh, plays, operations use cases, but it's primarily mm -hmm. speculating that the, the that the asset that you're borrowing is going to appreciate faster than the fee that you're paying to borrow it. Yeah, often, or people are using it to, to short assets. Um, but yeah, typically the, the use cases are um, not, uh, not very diversified at the moment. It, it's mostly just um, to kind of finance operations within crypto that you think is going to earn you more than you're paying, as you said. Um, that seems to be the typical use case. But these protocols and the teams working on it understand that, and they're trying to to branch out beyond that use case because they know to create you know actually fully functioning markets, they can't rely on kind of the demands of traders that want to access liquidity when you know crypto is doing well. So, for example, we see interest rates spike in you know in bull markets in crypto and then collapse like you know it's pretty volatile on the interest rate side because of that exact dynamic. They're trying to diversify away from that where there's more, um, you know, more on the demand side. An interesting one I've seen where there's actually, uh, it's an intermediary doing this, but they're accessing liquidity and then providing that um, credit to startups. And so they're going to, mm. uh, like, they're going to um, third world countries or, you know, places around the world and saying, we have access to capital that we can give to you for your startups. So like a, an under uh, addressed market is like, startup financing in uh, emerging regions and this project um, they've been working on accessing you know compound uh, liquidity and then providing that out using their own credit assessment um, so that's that's one that's actually a real use case outside of uh, speculation where there's value growing from these these businesses um, right. another is ave has um, just they're currently working on um, mortgages for uh, you know, basically, you could you could borrow from Alve for your mortgage. That seems like a very very um, far up use case in my mind because there's a lot mm. of like contract law around that. But that yeah. would be a diversification of uh, kind of the the core purpose currently. Yeah, I've interviewed Sonny Kolachev uh, from Ave, who's obviously a brilliant guy. And interestingly yeah. enough, one of the few people uh, in the DeFi space whose background is in law. He was a practicing attorney uh, before he came into this space. So if anyone can do it, I suspect it's Ave uh, because they have yeah. that sort of very much in their DNA. All right, Blake, I'm going to play devil's advocate now on lending. This is something that you've heard before. Uh, it's a critique that's fairly well known. Mm -hmm. It goes something like this. Basically, this entire space is dependent uh, upon new speculators coming into the space, 
broadening the base and putting in new capital. Some would actually say it's a Ponzi scheme. The more people who come in, the more uh, tokens can be issued uh, and the greater the rate uh, of demand for the underlying governance tokens, they say in this critique. I'm not sure uh, it's the most sophisticated criticism, but what are your thoughts on it that basically say, look, this works only because the price is going up, the price is going up because more and more people are coming in, there's increasing demand, but it's basically a house of cards. Yeah, that, that is a, a criticism you'll hear. I, I think that it, um, there's two very different things that are happening. One is the, the price of those governance tokens and people that um, enter crypto specifically to speculate on those governance tokens and the fundamentals of the technology that are being built. I would argue that without those governance tokens, we wouldn't see as much attention on DeFi, but the tech would be um, maybe not as well financed, but definitely still um, as important and significant to the future of finance um, as it would be otherwise. So that tech is real and it's growing and it's creating real fundamentals, but there is definitely excess speculation on top of that. That is, those things can both be true. And I think they, are, they, are, they both are true. Um, so that we have seen a lot of people enter just to speculate on governance token that creates high yield that then people are kind of just right. playing for the short term. But while these protocols are growing um, and people are using them, the fees that are going back to the governance protocols themselves, so the, the treasuries, the teams, if it's a DAO, that capital is then used productively by those developers to improve the fundamentals, to keep building and keep creating new products that will eventually become even more valuable than they are today. So, you know, we like say two months ago, three months ago, when the market was um, you know higher than it was today, that would be kind of a time of uh, where we might be seeing price leading fundamentals. Now, mm -hmm. as the market's pulled back, fundamentals have started to, to grow without price really reacting as much. Now, I, I don't want to comment directly on if like price and fundamentals currently make any sense, but compared to three months ago, it's definitely improving where we see people in these protocols are still building, um, people are still using them, not as you know, much as they were, but people are, you know, the capital still locked. Um, as of this morning, there was $108 billion in DeFi, still locked, um, still, you know, people are trying to use these protocols for what they were intended. Um, and the protocols are still earning revenue and they're still building to make these, you know, better for the years to come. Um, so I, I, I understand that criticism, um, but there's definitely, you know, real value that's being created here. You know, Blake, before we move through the rest of the taxonomy, let's talk a little bit about these first two use cases, DEXs and lending. Um, we've been talking about it now, uh, almost theoretically. Let's get you to take off your computer scientist hat, your um, tech guy hat, and talk about this as an investor. Obviously, that's what you guys do at Block Tower. How do you think about investing in this space? What are the opportunities? And why are you so bullish about it? Sure, happy, happy to go into this. This is the the fun topic, right? Is um, what, what's where are these going to go to, and you know how do we see them in the future? Early DeFi, um, all of like three years ago, um, was entirely uh, an idea. It was a dream. Um, so investing then was what if, right? Like what if we had DeFi? What if you know we truly had twenty four seven globally traded markets, or anybody could exchange anything of value um, anywhere in the world. Now, fast forward to 2020, we start to see these, um, you know, form in a way where, I'll take a step back actually, where the incentive that changed from kind of these dreams where we saw like $20 million in DeFi to billions was the concept of uh, yield farming, where governance tokens were introduced to, um, you know, obviously govern the protocol, make decisions, earn fees, but were paid out to users as an incentive for them to provide their capital. We saw a transition of people moving from, well, dollars from outside the system, obviously, lots of new capital inflows, but from ETH, Bitcoin, from a long tail of other crypto assets, moving those onto Ethereum, you know, via stablecoins or ETH, and then providing capital into uh, DeFi protocols to earn this yield. That, didn't, that then created kind of this po positive flywheel where more capital was introduced, more trading, you know, happened, and we saw more attention on the space, more, you know, capital, like from VCs went into the space where we started to see, you know, new protocols emerge and innovation happen. Um, so up until kind of 2020, it was very much a what if style uh, of investing, much more VC focused, where it's like, these don't have strong fundamentals yet, 
but there's this massive incentive now for people to participate. Um, they could, they, they function properly. So like you said, the computer science ad is like the, the pools work. They just haven't been tested. There's like a hundred million in them, not billions. So then over the course of last year, we saw the capital in those grow significantly and new attention emerge from the uh, crypto investment community. They're like, these things actually work. These incentives are great. There's people using them. We could easily see how this could emerge. Now kind of fast forward to 2021, it's much more about like kind of how we look at the market is what protocols are growing fastest in terms of um, their metrics. So hmm. TVL, total value locked um, is one of them where it's like, okay, this is growing quickly. We see, you know, billions in this protocol emerging, uh, you know, this much volume, um, market cap, um, a big number is of also inflation. So the flip side of that, um, of that, you know, incentive mechanism where inflation is encouraging adoption is inflation can also depress the price. And so we also, that's like another big metric is how much inflation does this protocol have relative to supply sinks that would take that inflation off the market. So staking is one of the most common supply sinks that removes inflation. Um, that's either like, you know, Aave, the, the lending protocol allows you to lock Aave tokens up uh, in exchange for some Aave yield. So that is still inflation, but the, the supply sink removes some of that inflation off the market. And then people participate in the protocol. They can earn fees from doing so. That's actually the revenue generated. Um, so we look at all that, um, kind of determine what assets we like, but it's still like, it's still largely, so like, even with those metrics aside, it's largely focused on the development of the core technology. I, even with all these, you know, fundamental um, numbers coming out, like revenue and you know value lock and volumes and you know um, metrics that combine those, we still can't ignore what is going to happen in the future because they're so early stage. So we'll look at you know Ave and what they're introducing on Ave Pro, which is a you know a new product that they're launching, and we'll say, is this exciting? Is this worth us you know allocating capital to because we think that will continue to grow over time, and because these fundamentals are starting to emerge. We expect that as new products are introduced, more capital enters the system, that that'll actually improve the fundamentals uh, for these projects. And then you can apply that same logic down the kind of the risk curve from the blue chips um, all the way down to kind of more speculative assets, where they're like, this is a new innovative concept. It's a new a AMM, a new type of lending under collateralized lending. Um, mm -hmm. What if, right? Like we, we see these fundamentals for this project. This tech is new. What if we saw those same fundamentals? Um, that, you know, because this is a, a new, you know, innovative way of approaching that market, it's more efficient, um, then we can invest in that over the long term. Um, so that's, that's a great example of kind of how we look for, like, it's, it's somewhat relative value from the existing, you know, DeFi blue chips, um, combined with kind of a fundamental view on how these markets are emerging, um, and how these products are emerging, and then applying that logic saying, okay, what, what, are the most exciting sectors, the most exciting use cases in those sectors that have the possibility to acquire that those that capital and those fundamentals. You know, you guys have one hell of a job. This is a complex, heterogeneous array of variables, different relationships, thinking about it, uh, obviously, on the financial economic side to understand what the incentives are, uh, to understand some of the potential for growth, and then evaluating the fundamental soundness of the technology of the underlying protocols to make sure that there aren't massive security holes or flaws in this. This is a very new and challenging space. You know, you mentioned one statistic earlier, I think you said about 180 billion dollars in total value locked, um, which is obviously a lot of money. But to provide some context on that, you know, the market cap of Apple right now uh, is nearly two and a half trillion. I think that's about 7% if the back mm. of the envelope math I did is right. I mean, this is an extraordinarily new young space, tremendous amounts of opportunity, also tremendous amounts of risk. How do you go about assessing this when someone walks up to you uh, at a party as I did actually where we first met and said, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Blake, I've got this uh, new protocol I've just heard about. You got to check it out. Where do you even begin that assessment? There's, there's actually different ways. Um, and I, I wouldn't argue there's one right way. Um, commonly, it really depends on kind of the, the style of project. But there's very, very credible projects that are st stepping back even further. There's a wide array of DeFi projects. There's anonymous developers creating random things. And then there's you know VC backed um, from the you know best in breed VCs that 
are supposedly vetted and you know will do great things and have lots of capital to continue building that mission. Along that curve, there's lots of ways that you have to look at each of those individually. So like the VC style project is very different underwriting than the the you know random anonymous developer. But that's not necessarily indicative of quality. And we've actually right. seen random anonymous projects like you know crypto would always be remiss of ever ignoring anonymous things because of Bitcoin. Like any you know you can't you can't discount it because it's anonymous. But it's a much harder, like exceptionally harder diligence because if you can't call up the team and ask them what's happening, it's it's you know even as investors in you know decentralized anonymous systems, we like talking to people and hearing what they have to say about the projects that they're building. Um, so the VC style project, we would talk to the team because we have access, right? We'd say, hey, you know, what are you building? Explain how the contracts are written. Um, depending on you know if we're going to be um, providing capital ourselves. We'll dig into the smart contracts. Um, that's a combination of me and some of the other guys on the team. Um, look into smart contracts and say, you know, are these at least have they been audited um, by a reputable auditing firm? Does it look professional? Like, have they clearly put in thought to this? Is the team made other things before? Um, if we're putting capital, there's a lot more. There's just a lot more checks that we have to put in place because we're very risk averse in providing capital into the systems. Investing in the governance tokens is a very, very different um, kind of risk profile because you're not directly exposed to your capital being lost. You're exposed kind of indirectly if the capital and the protocol is lost, the value might go down, but it's it's a little bit uh, segmented from that. So we'll look at the, the governance token and say, how exposed are we to that possibility? That's an easier threshold than saying, do we want to provide capital into, say, Uniswap or you know, SushiSwap or, or Compound or Abe? Uh, but it's often a technical review. Uh, it's kind of the short of it, which is you have to underwrite it from how do these contracts work? What are the incentives? Um, what are the, you know, is there Oracle attack risk? Are there other risks, the smart contract risk associated with with using it? Yeah. So let's move on and talk a little bit about stable coins. Uh, I'm curious, you mentioned a bit about the taxonomy there, I guess the sub taxonomy uh, of how you think about stable coins, uh, algorithmic stable coins on the one hand, fully collateralized stable coins, perhaps partially stable, uh, collateralized stable coins. Tell us a little bit about what you think of the state of play in that space and how you think about that taxonomy. People are or crypto investors are very excited about stablecoins and they continuously fund new stablecoin projects. Um, one, because they've done well and kind of they're complicated and traders and investors can uh, make money doing that, but still very, very early stage. So there's, I feel like the um, USDCs and Tethers of the world have a, a very clear you know, product market fit. They, everybody knows what they're getting into. With those, so stable, you know, 100% collateralized um, stable coins, where there is some redemption mechanism, either through you know the tethered treasury, if you, if you go that route, or through the you know through Coinbase or Circle, that right, that those will, those will always exist. That's like a very we simple. We should say you, you, we should say USDC, of course, is Circle, uh, and uh, yeah, for. Yeah. Sure. And and for for those um, without taking a position on it one way or another, there's been speculation about whether or not Tether is in fact a fully collateralized stablecoin, and perhaps even what fully collateralized means uh, relative to the quality uh, and liquidity of the collateral. Correct. Yeah, um, quality and liquidity of what's backing um, these assets is um, kind of a separate question that requires underwriting of each of the stablecoins. We. Right. That's more of a traditional diligence process, which is there's a company that's producing financial statements. They might have audits. They might have a banking relationship that you need to dig into to trust that that's um, that's the you know real value that they're saying that's there. So that's that's one um, segment of stablecoins. The more innovative um, segment of stablecoins is are these partially collateralized or entirely algorithmic stablecoins, where there is um, like it's either a two token model where there's a dollar stable coin backed by another crypto asset, or it's like a seniorage model where they're buying and selling units of it um, in order to kind of stabilize the price. There's been a lot of attempts. Um, there's some even with significant like you know market caps at this point, two billion plus for um, Fay was a recent one. Um, another is uh, Terra uh, and Luna. Um, they have two billion plus in, in their UST stablecoin. So all of these are different approaches, but none of them I would say are like the winner in the algorithmic stablecoin space right. because it's still so new. 
The oldest of these is actually uh, from MakerDAO, which also does lending. Dai is issued as uh, you know debt against the um, ETH that's provided by um, you know users and investors in the space. So ETH is added, people borrow Dai against that, and then they have to re- repay that plus the you know the fee for for borrowing. Um, that yeah. one's actually functioned pretty well. That's one of the the longer standing uh, uh, stable coins in the space. Yeah, and there are all. I mean, this is such an incredibly diverse, richly ramified field. It seems as though there are new uh, ideolo- ideologies coming online uh, every day uh, or every week, at very least, in the stablecoin space. Uh, I re- recently interviewed one of the founders from Ampleforth. Uh, that is kind of a stablecoin. It doesn't seek to be stable mm-hmm. in price. It it has uh, a floating price and a fixed supply. So there are all different kinds. Um, of ways of thinking about it. But let's ask this basic question. Let's try and understand what the use cases uh, are first for the, for the fully collateralized stable coins, uh, why someone would want to own something uh, that was uh, as always backed uh, or always trading at a fixed peg to the dollar like USDC, like Tether, uh, like Paxos. Talk a little bit about the use case for understanding why those become on ramps into the crypto space and why that's important uh, for retail investors, for institutional investors, uh, and for folks who are not living in dollarized economies. Yeah, the, the easiest way to kind of imagine a, a US, USDC, the uh, you know, stable coin of uh, circle and Coinbase, they, it's almost like Venmo dollars where you're trusting this FinTech company that has dollars and those dollars are traded within their credit system. But once it exits, so the difference then is Venmo, you can't exit those dollars from the Venmo system or but or PayPal, Venmo or PayPal. And then with Coinbase, those USDC are once exiting the you know Coinbase platform are um, decentralized, you know, ERC-20 assets built on top of, uh, of Ethereum, like any other asset that we've uh, we talked about on Ethereum. But why that's so exciting is you can have um, that dollar peg value that's redeemable for underlying dollars if you ever want to exit the system, but then interact with DeFi and interact with crypto in these global 24-7 markets without um, having to exit or hold a, a volatile asset. So this, ask, you know, it's, it, it is dollars, just dollars on the blockchain. If you want to say exit a volatile asset, you can exit into uh, dollars instead of having to always you know perpetually be, be long uh, that that risk so it really increases your flexibility within crypto to have different trading strategies um, another really exciting use case and one that's surprised me how quickly it emerged was a lot of capital markets are now done in USDC and that's probably an even bigger use case um, kind of unexpectedly where we'll fund early stage companies that we're investing in in USDC so they're not even taking dollars. So like a, a company um, in our portfolio raised $4 million recently, all in stable coins, and that's how they fund their operations. It's in, they don't have to wait on you know, wire delays, banking relationships, anything that would slow the process of us giving them the capital. It's we sign our legal agreement and then I you know, send it to them in 20 minutes. I just you know, open, up my, uh, uh, you know, open up our assets and, and send it over. And it's, it's instant and they then have access to their funds. It's programmable money, which is starts to be really cool. There's like streamable payment mechanisms where um, you could pay somebody continuously instead of once every two weeks, where it's continuously streamed from their wallet to you. So imagine the flexibility of employees accessing their pay in real time instead of um, kind of you know at, at incre- uh, increments. Similarly, um, on the you know business side, if somebody owes you money, you have access to that capital soon. So we started to negotiate agreements with that continuous streaming of capital, you know, either direction um, and starting to fund projects with, with stable coins. So it's a really exciting use case where that really gives them a lot more flexibility than they have to, you know, call up their bank, wait, you know, multiple, multiple days, pay wire transfer fees. Not that there's no fees in crypto uh, and those can be high themselves, um, right. but it, it is a lot more flexible. Yeah, and it's instant, instantaneous and irrevocable like a Fed wire payment would be, but it's much more convenient. There's no physically going into a bank and signing something while a yep. guy wearing a necktie uh, watches you sign your signature on a piece of paper. You know, Blake, yeah. you brought up an important point, which is the uh, notion of Ethereum being the backbone for a great deal of the DeFi space. Tell us a little bit about where we are. I know it's an overwhelming percentage of these products are based uh, fundamentally in Ethereum, but tell us 
where we are in terms of percentages uh, and what some of the competitive landscape looks like for Ethereum competitors, which has obviously been a very fertile space uh, over the last, say, 12 months. Ethereum is the majority of DeFi at the moment, but it's not the only home for it. And we've seen um, over like the 2016 to 2020 timeframe, a lot of new layer ones, um, you know, other basically competitors to Ethereum uh, launched their products and they didn't really have a use case. They're like, what do we do with our layer one? Like we, we want people to use it. Um, Ethereum has already, you know, kind of proven out that DeFi was a use case. So a lot of them have started to tackle um, that landscape with their treasuries, with their development teams to build DeFi on these alternative chains. So we've seen lots of others emerge that are, you know, credible and have um, their own ecosystems building on top of it. I don't know the exact numbers in my head, but Ethereum is still the vast majority of all DeFi. Um, but there are, you know, new um, exciting ones emerging, like Solana, for example, recently raised a couple hundred million dollars from. A16Z and a, a variety of investors. Um, I believe I can disclose this, but we were seed investors in the, the project ourselves. Um, and so, like we, um, you know, there are these new in, uh, new layer ones that have development teams focused on building similar use cases of exchanges, you know, lending, stable coins, all on top of these other existing layer ones. Um, but they're still much newer than Ethereum. The secondary kind of subset of that emergence of DeFi in other locations is interoperability and bridges between those. So we as investors hadn't traded assets on other blockchains until this year. Hmm. That, that might be so that might be slightly off by a couple of months, but very in the last one year time frame, maybe not since 2021, but it's a very new concept to have assets on, say, Solana or Phantom or Polkadot or Celo or Avalanche, or there's lots, right? Um, all of these, we've now recently started to bridge assets over from either centralized exchanges to, you know, or from decentralized bridges that allow us to move assets and start accessing, you know, these investment opportunities on these other, other chains. So that's like a very new concept um, in crypto. We're starting to see people become more comfortable with um, interacting across protocols and utilizing across protocols. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you know, you guys are one of the most sophisticated investors in the space and you've just come online uh, in the last 12 months or thereabouts uh, investing on other chains besides Ethereum. That's quite a statement. Yeah. yeah. To, to clarify, not investing in the base layer, those have existed for a while. It's investing yeah. in the tokens built on top of that. Right. And using, because... And the reason it takes longer is that they did exist, um, but underwriting Ethereum takes a lot of time, right? Like understanding the contracts um, and investing in, in um, you know, DeFi there was an undertaking. We also then had to do that same undertaking and same underwriting for new chains and the projects built on there, which we were less familiar with and less comfortable with. So it took a lot of time um, for us to be comfortable with the risk profile of these new projects. And so it just took us a little bit of time to get there. And, and you know, now we are there. And others are, are are catching up as well. Like you know, both VCs and um, you know hedge funds and traders in the space are interacting with these other protocols, building on these other protocols, um, kind of for the first time this last year since kind of DeFi uh, summer of 2020. Right. Interesting points. So as we move on through the taxonomy, derivatives and synthetics, I don't know if you treat this as one or as two, depending upon whether they're five or six, but tell us a little bit about, well, let's start with derivatives. What's the use case for derivatives and what's the current state of play? Uh, derivatives are much newer than other use cases. Trading and lending are kind of like the backbone and stable coins. I'd call those primitives at this point of DeFi, where every action um, in DeFi kind of comes down to one of those one of those three. You're probably using stable coins for a lot of the trading. Um, you're probably trading on exchanges or lending. Derivatives are kind of a step further. This primarily focuses on um, options contracts or perpetual um, perpetual markets or futures markets on DeFi. This is very new. Um, one of the um, kind of core protocols that's working on this, there's a few, uh, DYDX, Perpetual Protocol. Tell, tell us about what perpetuals are, because it's something that has a, a much greater degree of significance in the DeFi space than the traditional world. Tell us a little bit about the significance of perpetuals. 
Sure. So it allows you to um, long or short any given asset that has a perpetual for it, um, like that operates a perpetual market by paying um, a funding um, in either direction. So if you were wanted to go long an asset, um, there's people who will take the other side of that. And then there's a fee you have to pay that's basically the longs paying the shorts and the shorts paying the longs. But instead of a futures contract having a specific expiry, perpetuals, as the name indicates, are perpetual. They, they don't end. Um, and in exchange for that not ending, you have to um, accept those funding rates in either direction um, to access that uh, liquidity. So you'll say you want to take out a million dollar position on um, a specific perpetual, and you might have to pay like a, sometimes extremely high, depending on how the market is um, is currently trading. But it could be like ten percent annualized or higher, or you know sometimes it even spikes more than that to be that you know to to take that long or short. And that's just because it's a function of the supply and demand of that given perpetual market um, at that time. Um, so the, the concept of perpetual is relevant to DeFi because you, it's kind of the only way to price a decentralized contract in a way that is um, capital efficient. So um, DYDX, for example, is yeah. one of the older um, markets for this. And although it's not um, like, super high volumes even relative to uh, uh, decentralized exchanges, the, the traditional DEXs, there's still a fair amount of volume that goes through. So they have um, ETH perpetuals where you supply, um, you have to provide ETH into that market. And then you can take leverage on by you know trading in that uh, the market. You have to pay whatever direction that funding rate is. Um, so it's, it's just a, a way to access leverage in uh, DeFi where somebody's posting the collateral or you're paying you know, to, to provide the other side of that market. Yeah, I recently interviewed Antonio Giuliano from uh, DYDX. He's an incredibly smart guy. Uh, and he yeah. walked us through a bit about how that works. And obviously, uh, the supply and demand uh, for the perpetuals is based on the expectation of price in the underlying. Okay, let's talk a little bit about synthetics, uh, what they are and what role they play uh, in the DeFi ecosystem. Obviously a bit newer and a smaller use case than some of the others we've discussed, but potentially an important one. Yeah, I think that um, synthetics are one of the more exciting spaces, uh, you know, spaces of development uh, in DeFi because it makes a lot of sense to the rest of the world, right? Like it's a use case that currently isn't addressed at all by the traditional financial system for good reason, regulation primarily. Um, but DeFi and like or exchanging and lending assets is something people kind of already can do. Right? Like I can go trade um, equities or you know borrow assets without DeFi. Why do I need that? It's obviously different assets. Synthetics, on the other hand, are a very different uh, type of use case. Um, there's a few different approaches to this. Where there's synthetics exchange, there's Mirror Protocol. But effectively, they're all um, assets that are not on blockchains that are then represented on blockchains using um, kind of the same functionality as we talked about, where either people are providing collateral, they're taking the other side of that asset or that the direction of that asset for you. But effectively, it gives you synthetic exposure to an asset that doesn't exist in that native market. Um, so a common one is like Tesla stock can be traded on blockchains by anybody in the world 24-7, peer-to-peer, using these synthetic markets. And that's a very powerful use case where you could be entirely outside of the US financial system and have access to US equities. And th there's going to be a lot of like kind of contention in the, the coming years, I imagine, over control of equities because right. effectively, how do you, you know, if, if people are trading an asset that is not you know, you don't have the um, the right entitled to, and it's not sitting in, uh, you know, a clearinghouse somewhere on Wall Street. Right. It's it, there. There could be some issues, but from an investor perspective, I can move from Ethereum to stable coins to Tesla stock instantly and two swaps, and that starts. To, you can start to programmatically trade and yeah. access synthetic assets of all kinds, not not just uh, equities. It could be synthetic gold, synthetic oil contracts, synthetic anything. And certain once these synthetics are starting to, once they have a kind of a key base layer of, you know, high liquidity synthetics of different types, people start to build contracts on top of those. And you'll see the emergence of, you know, decentralized index products that yeah. include stock market or stocks that you're you know accustomed to alongside of crypto. So I can say I'm you know in anywhere in the world 
and I'm in Australia and I could, you know, buy a U.S. equity with, um, you know, with ETH and that U.S. U.S. equity then has exposure, you know, in the same way that uh, traditional asset would. Yeah, and I mean the the p- potential to get exposure to uh, traditional assets in different permutations uh, is just virtually limitless, uh, and something that is just incredibly interesting. Uh, you know, you could talk about the the relationship uh, between, uh, for example, the custody of the underlying asset and that risk. I guess one could say that markets will price that right. So if there's a spread between the synthetic uh, and the underlying, it's markets uh, as investors price. Uh, what they believe the risk is of getting exposure to the underlying uh, or some sort of a failure to produce the underlying asset, uh, that will be priced in. But there are also all kinds of legal, regulatory compliance questions around this, uh, international jurisdiction, settlement issues. I mean, the list of potential uh, concerns is very large. But the flip side, precisely as you point out, Blake, is the idea that you can trade assets 24 by 7, 365 in any jurisdiction without access to a dollarized banking system, this is something that has just the potential to be immense. Yeah. And I, I, one interesting quirk of that exact um, function is equities don't trade 24 seven, but the synthetics do. And right. so that's a, it starts to become, if they actually ever come to maturity, it would be irrational for equity investors not to trade synthetic stocks that are being priced intraday. Because if you can access that same equity all the time, why are you not trading it when, like, if that's your mandate, if you're a trader, right? Like, why are you not trading it for the, the weekend? There's, it's not, you know, eight hours. It's, it's whole multi days. It's crypto never takes a day off. There's no holidays in crypto. There's no, you know, weekends and vacations. It's not like the, the, the market stopped in these synthetics we've actually seen. And so uh, earlier this year, there was some um, like kind of retail mania around um, silver and silver actually had synthetics in crypto and the price of silver deviated you know, greatly between the last close price um, in traditional markets to the weakened price of silver and crypto. And, uh, you know, if you're a very sophisticated investor, you might have, you know, a way to do that. But as a retail investor, particularly, you wouldn't have access to that, you know, your long silver position in your traditional brokerage account, but you could go to crypto and say, oh, I, you know, could, could take the other side of that if I wanted to, because I don't want to be, be long silver. And eventually, as these synthetics grow, why wouldn't you, right? Like it starts to become a competitive force that forces all, you know, traditional investors into these scheme, you know, into the, these markets if they have that mandate to trade it. Yeah, I can almost see the framework, right? When I was a young guy in my 20s working at a bank, we used to be able to leave on a Friday night and go to the Jersey Shore or the Hamptons and not think about this until Tuesday morning on a long weekend. Those days are gone. Uh, Obviously, there are going to be some efficiencies that are going to be coming in. There's going to be opportunity. Uh, There's also going to be, I think, just a a conceptual shift uh, that's going to change the way assets are priced and the way people think about these markets. Yeah, for sure. I'm... being in crypto, you uh, we, we we haven't really had access to those uh, uh, you know comfortabilities. We've been used to twenty four seven markets kind of since uh, inception. It's uh, never never given us a break. <laughs> Let's talk about your final use case insurance. You mentioned mm-hmm. Nexus Mutual, uh, whose founder has been on Real Vision uh, in the past. Let's talk a little bit about what the use case is uh, for insurance, because this is kind of a a meta theme that runs through all of these other use cases. Yeah, uh, insurance. Like decentralized insurance was introduced to address the key risk in crypto, which is smart contracts. Um, interestingly enough, the uh, mechanism to insure is also smart contracts, which is kind of uh, an interesting uh, irony of it. But it comes from a lack of traditional insurance underwriters providing um, any sort of way to, to cover your activity in crypto. They're still not touching DeFi activity. There's some that have started to insure. Um, like obviously custodians and more centralized players where the business is known. But how do you, as an insurance company, provide insurance to a global set of users that you don't know them? It's not a business. It's literally just a contract with some code. Well, insurance companies don't know how to price that risk. They don't know how to handle that risk. They don't know how to pay out if they even know how to price that risk because it's just functionally different. And so it has to be a crypto native solution to crypto native problems. And that's where, where Nexus Mutual came in. They, um, they were one of the first, um, and definitely the first to, to see succeed at any scale. And they provided a, an interesting hybrid between a traditional 
insurance model and a decentralized insurance model where the company is a UK registered uh, insurance mutual um, or a cooperative, I believe, and allows those members some um, kind of you know, peace of mind that they understand and own that underlying collateral. You have to KYC in the mutual. Um, there's a contract between capital providers that are insuring uh, the protocol and, um, and, and the mutual. So say if you know, the uh, mutual members wanted to liquidate the collateral that backs the insurance um, on the platform, they could effectively. It's hard to say if that could ever ha could, you know, happen practically, but legally it, it is possible. Um, so that was introduced, that model where kind of bridging some of the traditional aspects of uh, a registered company with some claim over the assets. Then all of the insurance coverage is on the, the, the DeFi side where users can go and buy coverage, pay a premium to cover specific risks in um, smart contracts. So the key is protocol failure. That's, uh, that's one that is the core of what Nexus covers. They also have yield tokens depegging coverage where it's like if you know you have one of these synthetic assets or a token that represents um uh, your you know rights to the underlying collateral you can ensure that that price stays the same and you have to pay a premium for that um it's right now i think about two percent a year two two point six percent a year um to ensure the like curve tokens for example curve is a common uh, yield mechanism that the curve tokens paid out to, to users you can ensure that to make sure that the price stays what it says it's going to be using Nexus Mutual. So you pay that premium. The premium goes to the capital providers um, that are insuring that risk. It's up to the individual Nexus holder that is providing the insurance backing, the capital pool, to say if that contract is um, safe. And it kind of allows a, a semi-functioning market. It's, it's not perfect yet because it's, insurance is very, very new. And there are new attempts at this. There's something like $500 million right now in outstanding cover against smart contracts. Um, that is mostly, I think it's entirely Ethereum based on uh, Nexus at the moment, but it has coverage on some of the major protocols like Aave and Alpha and Yearn Finance where people have go, go and earn yield. Um, and it, it's starting to you know, starting to grow. We, I, I think there's a lot that still has to come and we'll see new models emerge, but that is like kind of an early primitive in providing some sort of coverage on the key risks within crypto. Yeah, and I should say that one of Real Vision's co-founders, Remy Tito, actually interviewed uh, Hugh Carp, uh, the founder of mm -hmm. Nexus Mutual, uh, on Real Vision. So if you're interested in hearing more about Nexus Mutual, please go and check out that interview. Boy, Blake, I have to say there are very few people uh, who can explain the DeFi space at all, uh, and even fewer who, like yourself, can explain it in a framework that's comprehensive, uh, where all of the interrelationships make sense. You have an impressive understanding and grasp and ability to convey this general taxonomy and all of the things that roll up underneath it. I hope you'll come back and join us uh, soon to continue this conversation. Yeah, I would love to. I mean, if, if your audience wants to hear more, I'd be uh, happy to go more in depth. I have no doubt they do. Blake, before we leave, give us some final takeaways, key points uh, that you would like to leave our viewers with on this space. Sure. I would say that um, key takeaway is that DeFi is still early. There are risks, but there's a lot of opportunity. It's um, it, There's always going to be narratives on, you know, if DeFi is too risky, if it's dead, if it competes with traditional financial systems. Um, my personal take is that it, it won't directly compete for a while, but it's going to be not a, a replacement to the existing system. It's going to be an alternative system. And in that framework, um, an alternative is always relevant. Even if it doesn't replace, it would be irresponsible to ignore an alternative. Um, it's not necessarily better and, and not necessarily worse. That's up to, I think, in, every individual to decide. But it will exist and it will continue to grow. And it's something that needs to be explored and researched and you know understood in depth because it's going to persist. There's lots of interest, um, even as price changes and you know the, the, the names, the, the faces, the protocols change. There's an underlying you know, upward momentum of people, um, smart people, smart investors, developers, building these protocols that want to see it grow into something more. Blake Richardson, Block Tower Capital, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for watching, everyone.